Welcome to Wine Soundtrack South Africa. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world. In 30 Answers, discover their stories, personalities and passions. Hello friends and listeners of Wine Soundtrack. This is Marina Kahlo and today I'm joined by Lucinda Haynes from Illumis Wines. Lucinda, a very warm welcome. Lovely to, uh, to chat to you today. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Hi Morena, uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, so my name's Lucinda, I was born in Namibia and everyone always asks me how does somebody who was born in the middle of the desert end up in the wine industry? <laughs> but here I am. So grew up in Namibia and then came to Salamash University where I studied winemaking and viticulture and yeah, that's, that's, and I've just kind of stuck around in this area ever since. Um, but I have traveled a bit overseas worked some harvests in other countries and um, now I'm making my own wine here at Karabib Winecraft which is located just outside of Stellenbosch on the Pulka Dry Road and my brand is called Illumis. That's, it is quite interesting, I mean where did wine enter the fray in, as your life kind of took its, took its course? So it's interesting, I actually grew up in a family with an appreciation for wine. So wine, and my mom's a very good cook, so food and wine was always part of um, part of our household and my parents are very social people so they're often, often entertained, so like I said, food and wine was always just part of it. And when I had to decide what I wanted to go and study, I had various options. I first thought that I was going to be a lawyer, then I thought I was going to be a doctor, and then Eventually I kind of started looking into winemaking and what really intrigued me about winemaking is there's a part of it that's science but there's also a part of it which is a bit creative and where you have to sort of use your intuition and there are some things which we don't always fully understand so that's kind of where the intuition part comes in and you inevitably work with nature which you know always uh, changes things up a bit and keeps you on your toes because every year is different and you get to be outside you get to be active uh, during your day you don't sit behind a desk all day and those were the things that kind of really intrigued me about winemaking and now that I'm running my own business you know it's not just winemaking and science and nature inevitably you have to do marketing and you have to do sales and you have to understand business plans so it really has kind of brought me to a place of where I can say what I do for a living is very interesting and has de- many different facets, which is what I really enjoy. Yeah, I agree with you. I think um, for me, uh, uh, wine is something that is made by scientists who create art. That's that's kind of my perception, but you're so right. You know, when, you, when you're a uh, a brand when you own this brand you've got to be the chief cook and bottle washer and you kind of have to just know how to do everything and spread yourself quite thin sometimes but it's an amazing experience because you really get to um, experience different sides of running and owning a business so the name Elemis where did you where did you get that what does it mean what does it stand for So Illumis means clarity in Latin and when I make wines I really want the wine to be a window into the vineyard and I want the vineyard to reflect in the wine. When I studied I always thought that I was just going to be a winemaker but I really fell in love with vineyards in my final year and actually started working in the industry as a viticulturist so my passion really developed for the viticulture side because you can't really make good wine without good grapes and I'm very passionate about that part and when I make wine I always kind of start with the end product in mind so I've got an idea of what I want the wine to taste like what sort of style of wine I want to make and then I buy grapes from vineyard sites that would sort of automatically lend itself to that style so that I don't have to force the style in the cellar and that's part of the whole idea of this transparency in the process and the clarity and having the vineyard shine through and if you look at the front label the two L's um, towards the top of the label turn into this vine that's unpruned and um, that symbolizes the minimum intervention approach in the winery. So I really want to, my intention behind the hands-off approach in the winery is because I really want the vineyard to shine in the wine. Mm-hmm. And you've alluded to 
buying in uh, grapes from from different vineyards. Where where are all of these vineyards, and roughly how many uh, vineyards do you do you work with um, in terms of hectares? So at the moment I buy grapes from Elgin, from Darling, from the Polka Dry Hills in Stellenbosch and also from Wellington and each, actually since I started all of my wines have been single vineyard wines and I've since the beginning worked with the same vineyard sites and what's really exciting about that for me is over time when you work with the same vineyard you really get to know the vineyard, you really get to understand how it behaves uh, depending on the season and you know, I think we always hope that someday we're going to f- have it all figured out, but you know, nature keeps us learning, which is what I really enjoy about working with the same vineyards. So I don't work with that many different vineyards, um, and that's, but there's something about that that I really like. And I source from uh, really far and wide, as you heard, and the reason why I source so far and wide is because I've got a very specific intention with each of the wines, and then of course the grapes get sourced from those vineyards for that specific reason. Um, so that's uh, that's where I get my grapes from. You, We chatted before um, the recording started and you said that uh, you've ramped up your production volumes a bit this year. What is your annual production roughly and, and what's the aim in terms of growth? So last year I bottled about 8,000 bottles and this year I've pushed it up to 21,000 bottles. Um, you know, this has always been <clears throat> the dream to kind of um, br- turn this into a proper business and at some point you have to take leaps to do that. So I've just taken this leap and uh, it's very exciting because I've managed to um, get a few more export markets for my wines and also I've opened up a few more local markets and I think that's really given me the sort of platform to kind of take a leap and take a bigger jump Um, and you know I don't even want to cap I don't really want to put a cap on where I'm going with this I think the the dream would always be to keep it small at the moment I'm only making four different wines and you know we're always tempted to make more wines and every time I see a new vineyard that I'm intrigued by, I kind of want to, you know, oh, maybe maybe I could make wine from this. This would be such an interesting one. People would phone me and they would say, oh, listen, I've got this old vineyard and don't, aren't, you, aren't you interested in buying the, wine, the, the grapes? And we're always tempted, but I, I think at the moment I have to kind of brain myself in and um, for now I just want to stay focused um, and do what I do very well before I expand too much or too quickly, but never say never because you never know what the future holds. I think that's a great approach to have, to be honest with you. You are woman alone at this point in time, pretty much, and, you know, keep it focused. I always liken it to going to a restaurant um, with a massive menu that is pages and pages and pages and it, the food is nice but there's nothing that really stands out because there's just there's no real focus whereas if it's focused and you've got a small menu but a menu that is perfectly cooked and perfectly prepared because they've got the time and they know that the ingredients that are sourced are source specific to to this menu i just i i think there there's a lot of similarity in that approach for me but anyway that's just me so you you make four wines in your range which one is the most expensive what does it cost and what's in the bottle the most expensive wine at the moment is the chenin blanc and that retails for 270 rand i source the grapes for that from elgin and since the 2022 vintage i've actually sourced the grapes from both elgin and stellenbosch and i'm particularly fond of this wine although I don't have favorites in my range people always ask me which one is my favorite but I can't choose Uh, there's a very specific reason why I make all of the wines but I when I worked in Southern California we worked with uh, cool climate white wines because we were located right on the coast and I really fell in love with cool climate white wines and that's also kind of a preference stylistically in terms of what I enjoy drinking and for my own brand, I really wanted to do a white wine from a cool climate. But interesting, in South Africa, I would say the majority of uh, white grape varieties that are planted in the cooler sites are Chardonnay or Sauvignon Blanc or Riesling. 
and I happen to know about this Chenin Blanc vineyard in Olgen and it's quite unique to find Chenin Blanc in such a cold area in South Africa. It's not a variety that's generally planted in cooler sites. And the vineyard has this beautiful Bokefeld shale soils. It's basically just covered in rocks. And I, I just thought it would be very interesting and a point of difference to make a Chenin Blanc from a colder area. Uh, so in terms of the profile of the wine, it's a bit different to what people always expect from Chenin Blanc. There's a lot of linearity and minerality in the wine, um, some salinity on the finish. Uh, not to say that you don't get those characteristics in Chenin from other areas, but I just think it's quite unique to have Chenin Blanc from Elgin. It really is. I mean, it's not something that Elgin is known for. It's Chardonnay, maybe some Riesling, Sauvignon Blanc, but not not really Shannon. so that's um that's great it's really really interesting um do you believe in a perfect variety oh that's a tough question perfect variety in terms of taste or f- in terms of farming right. with <laughs> well what would a perfect variety be one that you can make different styles of wines with one that uh, doesn't get any diseases in the vineyards <laughs> one that uh, would appeal to every consumer on the planet. That would be perfect. I mean, we, I suppose <laughs> those would all be really wonderful if we could get, uh, could get one of those perfect varieties. But then I also think variety is the spice of life. And I think the fact that, you know, we have all these different varieties that behave in different ways depending on where they're planted and what the terroir and the climate is and what the winemaker does with it, um, that's what keeps wine interesting and what's, what I think keeps it interesting for consumers. Because imagine all wine tasted the same. Or imagine that consumers only drank one style of wine. I think it would be so boring. Um, so maybe no perfect varieties for now. Maybe yeah. just some that are a little bit easier to work with than others. <laughs> That's a very good answer, I must say. Um, in terms of a consumer, being a consumer yourself, what do you enjoy drinking? Sure, that's also a tough question, hey? What am I having for dinner? What's the weather like? (laughs) I think all those things play a role in my decisions. I think if I had to look at my wine shelf, there's variety for sure. Um, There's a little bit of everything. But I think in terms of the wines that I actually, the wines that I drink more of, I would say, are lighter style red wines. And I think that's also reflected in the style of the Illumis wines, they're lighter style red wines. So I think that's, at the moment, my preference is lighter style red wines. And then I love cool climate white wines, as I've mentioned before, white wines that have a little bit more linearity, but at the same time, complexity and texture. But, um, and I, I'm, quite a, I'm quite a sucker for all the little oddball varieties at the moment, you know, the Cinsos, the Grenaches, um, Mouvad, it's Carignans, the things that, you know, aren't really the run of the mill sort of wines, uh, maybe because I just enjoy taking the road less traveled. Yeah. yeah, that makes perfect sense. And as you say, it kind of reflects your, your style in, in terms of winemaking very much so. In terms of food and wine pairing, is that something that you believe there's kind of a recipe and this is how you do it? Or what would you say would be your philosophy behind food and wine pairing? I think the key is to be adventurous. I, th- I, I think in the past we've, or people often have very fixed ideas. You, you know, if you're having a big, heavy, red, piece of red meat then you need to have a big heavy red wine to go with that or if you're having fish then you should be drinking white wine and I th- I do also believe that people are a lot more adventurous with food and wine pairings and I think this, the secret there is to, to just kind of not not be put in a box or to not think within a box when it comes to that uh, but there's definitely value in food and wine pairings I've definitely experienced where you can have a meal with a wine and the food actually doesn't make the wine taste as good or um, the wine doesn't shine as well as it usually does on its own. So I've seen that, I've seen instances where where wine tastes better depending on the food that you're having it with. So there's a, 
I de- food and wine definitely goes together, for sure. I, I, I think, you know, if you think they don't, then they do. But I think sometimes maybe we complicate food and wine pairings too much. But I've had a food and wine tasting pairing experience um, in Nordic, and I can tell you now it is... That chef definitely made everyone on the table taste better. Mm. So there's definitely value in it. I think I know the chef you're referring to, and yes, he has a knack for for exactly that. He just, it, it's magic that happens. It reminds me a little bit of that that um, Pixar movie Ratatouille, where the little rat is t- t- kind of tasting the flavors, and you can see everything that's going on in his brain as he's putting these flavors together. And, and that, that, to me, is the perfect wine pairing uh, with food. Um, do you have a hangover cure? Surf and asleep. Surf and asleep. <laughs> See, the surf part, there's a few winemakers who say the surf part, but I can't drag myself up to, to try and compete with the great whites in our ocean. <laughs> and a big breakfast, a big oily breakfast. Yeah, I think, I think the breakfast and the sleep uh, is probably where I would go. Very cool. Um, so... Lots of producers walk around in their cellars and they speak to their barrels or they walk through their vineyards and speak to the vines. Is there any kind of connection like that that you feel to your vines or your wine? I think I think inevitably as a winemaker, yes. There's, um, yes, I think we are connected to our product. I'm definitely guilty of being very hard on myself as a winemaker so uh, you know you I always taste my wines and think oh but I you know it should be and how am I going to do this better and how am I going to change this but I think that's a good thing Um, but yes I I think we really are connected to our product in a in because I uh, you mentioned art earlier and uh, and it's really something that you've created and um, if you really think about that it is quite magical Um, there's something magical about about putting creating something and putting it in a bottle and opening it at maybe years afterwards and you it's almost like you've you have a little time capsule and you're connected to that product in a way and and the, it's really magic I, I I once had this experience in the Loire Valley where this winemaker opened up a bottle of 1942 Chenin Blanc for me so his grandfather made this wine in the middle of the Second World War I mean can you just imagine that it's basically war in the middle of France and you're still making wine and the bottle had this sort of strange blue hue, the glass because apparently during the war they couldn't get all the usual raw products for making glass so that's why the glass bottles had that strange colour and that wine I mean, 1942 Chenin and you think, oh it's probably, not. and it wasn't a sweet style wine, it was a dry style wine you almost think that, oh, it can't be that good. That wine was phenomenal. I just remember tasting it, and I remember this tastes like it, Italian gelato on a wafer cone. It was absolutely amazing. And, the, and, and for me, that thought of someone putting that in a bottle in 1942 and people enjoying it so many years after, there's, there is always this sort of magical fairy dust in, in wine. So, yeah. That's a pretty cool story, hey? Sure. Lucinda, when you were a little Lucinda, what did you want to be? A vet. A veterinarian or a dancer, I believe, or an actress. I think those were very high on the list when I was very small. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I love that question. (laughs) And uh, when you're not busy in the cellar or in the vineyard, what what do you do to, uh, to spend your time? I do spend a lot of time in the ocean surfing, uh, so I'd say that's a, it's interesting, it's a hobby that I started uh, later in my life. I wish I started when I was younger because it's quite a tricky uh, sport to learn, but I'm addicted to it. So, uh, and it's what I really love about surfing is, in a way, you, you also experience this connection with nature and it reminds me a lot of what we do in the winery. Uh, you know, every time you go into the ocean, the ocean is different because it's high tide or low tide or depend, it depends on the phase of the moon, what the ocean's doing and um, the waves are different. So you have to adjust 
whatever you're doing to the conditions of the ocean and there's this sense of tranquility when you're there and it's almost you know when we're working with nature the vineyards behave and respond differently every year and as winemakers we have to adapt and respond to what nature's doing um, when the grapes arrive at the cellar so there's quite a thread for me between surfing and and what I do for a living um, yeah, so I, I do spend a lot of time in the ocean. If I don't see the ocean for a few weeks, there's something not aligned <laughs> in my being. But And then I also really just enjoy spending time with people. Um, I love cooking. Um, I love wine and just generally being outside and in the outdoors and in the mountains. Yeah. And uh, in terms of music, is that something you're into? Any particular genres or styles or artists or anything like that? I think my music taste is extremely eclectic and it varies a lot. I remember at the end of last year, you know, at the end of the year, Spotify makes a playlist for you. And I, for some reason, very distinctly remember at the end of last year, <coughs> Spotify came out and they said to me, you ventured into the genre verse this year and we tried to contain yeah I mean have you ever heard of that and they said we tried to contain your year in a playlist but we couldn't (laughs) (laughs) and that was it wow that is I haven't heard of that before but um yes okay very diverse we'll we'll trust Spotify on this one um what would you say is the best piece of advice you've ever received or one can turn it around to say what would be the best piece of advice that you would wish to impart on someone Hmm. I think one of the biggest pieces of advice that I think is actually really wonderful is to not take anything personally because if you don't take anything personally, it's actually very uh, liberating. So I think that's just off the top of my head what I can think of now. No, that's a great, great, great piece of advice. What would you say is your proudest achievement in your career so far? Hmm. That's a tough one. I was, uh, I would say the acclaim that my Pinotage received, my first vintage of Pinotage received last year. I just never expected um, so many people to uh, talk about it as much as they did and I received a Platter 5 star for it and a Wine Mag 95 point rating and I was blown away by, by all of that so I would say that's probably um, at the moment something that's um, very fresh in my memory of something that I felt was quite a yeah, just a very nice achievement and recognition for the style of vines that I've been making. That's very cool. It is, that is pretty impressive, by the way, let me tell you. So some people read um, tea leaves in the bottom of a teacup to tell the future. If you could read the sediment that is left over in a glass after the red wine has been drunk, what will that? What story will that sediment tell about the future of Elimus? Hmm. I think it will say that uh, it will say that a lot of a lot more people are going to be drinking Elimus in the near future, <laughs> and people from all walks of life will be drinking Elimus in the future. And it would say that. Oh, there's another, mm, there's definitely, oh, there's another wine in the lineup. Mm. It's a little bit vague if it's red or white, but there's definitely another one in the lineup. And, oh, sorry, the, the sediment's a bit blurred in the other corner, so I can't really see what, what that <laughs> says. But uh, you know, maybe there's a few more stars sitting in the other corner. Yeah, I think that's what I'm seeing right now. Very, very exciting stuff. I, um, I think if, if that was my, my future, it would, it would certainly get me excited. Um, if you could share a bottle of wine, any bottle in the world, with anyone in the world, either alive or dead, what 
would you be drinking and who would you be drinking it with? Hmm. That's a really long list of people on that list, I'd say. And the list of wines are equally as long. Um, mm-hmm. It would be really amazing to enjoy a bottle of Chateau Rayas, 1989, simply because it's a wine that I have had, and I remember it changing my perspective of wine. You know, I've often tasted wines which I very distinctly remember because it changed my perspective about wines. So that would that would definitely be um, it would be really great if that bottle could be on the table. Mm-hmm. And in terms of mm, gosh, who would I choose? I think it could be quite fun to sit at the table with. Uh, <laughs> The founder of Spanx, Sarah Blakey. (laughs) Simply because she's a self-made millionaire who literally started her career selling fax machines door to door and who built this tremendous company with an idea that she had. And on top of all of that, she seems to still find the time to have fun and enjoy life and to make a difference in other people's lives. And for me, that's quite inspiring to be able to find the balance between all of that and just having that completely bogus idea and turning it into something so completely successful. So I think it could just be interesting to share some, you know, just share share some notes with her. Not like I can contribute much, but you know. Very, I, I can honestly say to you that is the best answer to that question that I've had so far. So uh, I love it. Very, very original. If you could have any celebrity photographed at some swanky restaurant by the paparazzi with a bottle of your wine on the table... Um, to be splashed all over the the front pages of the the the, the tabloids, who would that celebrity be? It would be pretty cool if it was Eddie Redmayne. Really cool, yeah. But then you know what would be a really big bonus right now is if Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling were somewhere and they were spotted with my wine because I think they're everywhere in the news right now. Yeah, yeah. they are super super popular right now. They're the 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 Barbie Ken joy of our lives. <laughs> what sort of wines do you think will be drunk in the year 2300? Well, maybe exactly what we're drinking now because the wheel would have been reinvented five times by then. I mean, isn't that just what we do? We keep on reinventing the wheel. So, you know, probably, you're probably right. So I think, um, uh, it's all becoming more and more natural. It can't get any more natural, and I don't see that narrative changing anytime soon. So, uh, yeah. Name three wines you would take with you to a deserted island. Chateau Rayas. <laughs> that keeps coming back. A Loire Chenin and a Pinot from Chambol Muzini. That was very quick. Very, you knew exactly where you were going to go with that. Is there a winemaking area anywhere in the world that you'd still like to explore? Um, mm-hmm. Yes, I actually would love to explore a little bit of Portugal's wine regions. I have not been there yet and I would definitely like to explore that region for sure. I think it's very interesting there, definitely. Very nice. Okay, so we're almost done. Before we finish, I'm going to play a game with you. So I am going to name three varieties or styles of wine. And I would like you to pair each one with music. 
So either a genre of which apparently you like all of them, or a an artist, or you can be as specific as a song. Mm. So just you know the thought of this this grape and why you bring those two together. So I feel like I need to put some Shannon in here. Shannon, I'm just picturing summer day and something a little bit just fun to go with the sunny weather and people around the table and just, oh, let's just Taylor Swift this one. That's a very cool one, actually. I can see it because it's so versatile, as is she. Nice. Let's go with Grenache. Grenache. For Grenache, I would say... Hmm. I think some cafe music with Grenache. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just because it's a little bit more of an interesting variety, a little bit more niche, not everyone's cup of tea, but uh, a very intriguing variety. And yeah, just... uh, something something different I actually really like that answer it's kind of got a bit of a chill but quirky funky vibe to it yes like it very much let's go with pinotage oh well if it's my pinotage um, which is a bit more of a lighter style pinotage uh, just uh, Kind of in a sundowner, I'm seeing that sundownerish friends around the prize, some thievery corporation, I think could be an interesting twist. That is an interesting twist. I like it very much. That's really cool. Um, please, can I ask that as we close off, firstly, thank you for a great interview. It was lovely chatting to you. Um, Lucinda, do you want to tell our listeners where they can uh, reach out to you online, uh, social media, any of those platforms? Yes, I've got a website, www.ilimuswines.com, where they can get more information about the specific wines and where they come from. And then I do also have an Instagram account, Ilimus Wines, and they can follow me there to keep up to date with what's happening in the vineyards and in the cellar. Awesome. Well, I thank you for your time and all the best. Thanks for listening to a new episode of Wine Soundtrack South Africa. For details and updates, visit our website, winesoundtrack.com.